Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's another edition of 153greatfish.website. Um, we're going to continue our series tonight on uh, the book of Revelation. We're going to start with lesson three of 12. It's very important that you go back and watch uh, lesson one and lesson two, which are on our website. Uh, let's pray and invite the presence of Jesus, shall we? Lord God, we praise you, mighty Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to be part of the Bible study tonight. Lord, give us an anointing to understand this time and this hour that we're living in. In Jesus' name, amen. And before I begin, I'd like to say no man knows the date nor the hour. I'm not a date setter. I would love to be able to know the date, but no man shall know it. So I reserve the right to be wrong. That's the right way to say it. But let's go right to the PowerPoint, shall we? Tonight, we're going to talk about the throne room. The throne room. Can you say praise the Lord? Now, here's our outline and understanding uh, lesson three of 12. First is that the book of Revelation is a persuasion and it uses metaphors, a structural narrative and visual images. Now, I know these three phrases just bounced off your head, but let me say it again, metaphors, structural narrative and visual images. If you understand that this is how it speaks and this is how it persuades us, then uh, it'll be much easier for you to uh, read this book on your own and go deeper than maybe I'm going to go tonight. Let's first talk about the throne. Then we'll, uh, we'll talk about the throne room objects and persons after we get done talking about this. Uh, we'll talk about the objects and the persons. That's very important to understand. And then we're going to talk finally about the meaning of the seven scrolls and the seven seals. That's where we'll conclude tonight. So let's keep going. So what is Revelation, the book of Revelation, trying to persuade us of? Well, this is my thought on it. It's trying to persuade us about the power, the sovereignty, the majesty, the love, the wrath, identity, and worship of Jesus Christ, plus the prophetic future of his kingdom, the true church. Those are seven things I think it's trying to demonstrate throughout the book. He's powerful, he's sovereign, he's majestic, He's love, he's wrath, he's, his identity is Jesus Christ, the one God, and everybody falls down and worships him. And isn't it nice that he cares enough about us to give us the prophetic future of his kingdom, the true church, so that we can understand uh, when we see the signs approaching. So Revelation uses metaphor. Now this is a literary comparison. And uh, what I mean by a literary comparison, it always uses one thing uh, in literature to describe another thing. So we do this all the time without knowing it. We compare one thing to another. Um, he's strong as an ox. That's a good one. That's a literary comparison. That's a metaphor. Or we might say that uh, he's uh, as old as the hills. Okay, those are metaphors. But it does this uh, using Old Testament scriptures, which we call allusions. When there's a scripture in Revelation that looks like it came straight out of uh, the Old Testament, that's an illusion where we can get further meaning on what the, the scripture is trying to tell us in Revelation. And of course, a metaphor is an Old Testament type and a shadow, which we know that the, the temple was a uh, tabernacle was a type and shadow to help us understand the heavenly temple, which we're going to see tonight. Now, structural narrative is basically a bunch of words that creates an infographic. <laughs> it should create a, an image in our mind. It's an illustration. Okay. And then finally, uh, Revelation uses visual images. Now what these images do, it transforms the symbolic into inspirational information. And there's a lot of images and symbols in the book of Revelation. We need to go through every one of them to try to understand or get a picture to inspire us what these things mean. Now, there are four worlds that are addressed in the book of Revelation, okay? And it's very important to understand what these four worlds are. Number one is the physical world. That's a world that we see through our own personal perspective. Keep in mind that we should try to place ourselves in history in the second century, right after this book was written, and also in our current time. So God wants us to place ourselves in both of these uh, physical locations. And as we'll see, it's possible that the book of Revelation describes a long period of history. We may to place ourselves in several physical worlds to try to understand this. But it's been my uh, belief that this is where most exegetes, people that try to interpret the book of Revelation, have gone wrong. And I'll explain that uh, uh, here shortly. Then we need to look at the world through a social lens. This is a world that's unique to our own time and culture. 
Uh, if you're an American like I am, you'll, you'll see the book of Revelation through this lens. If you're from Europe or if you're from Africa, you'll see it through a different lens through your own time and culture. Then there's a symbolic world. Okay, that's the world of paradigms from our traditions. The key word here is traditions. So we're going to need to look at these symbols and consider the, tradi the traditions of the past. And then finally, it's a spiritual world. This is a world describing God and his angels. Um, this is a world that's very difficult for us to understand. In fact, Paul went to the third heaven and he heard words that were unlawful to utter. In other words, there were no human words to describe what he was seeing. And so God gives us something that's human or physical to try to understand the spiritual world. But let's admit that it's not adequate. We can't really understand it till we get there. So we're trying to, he's trying to give us a picture to help us. Uh, it's very difficult for us uh, to understand these things. Uh, so he tries to give us something simple in our physical world to try to describe it. Okay. What, uh, Revelation is also, it's a three-act drama. Okay. You have to understand that God had John write this as a drama. This is describing Jesus and the Christian story in advance. It's history in advance. It's a prophecy. This prophetic drama consists of a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we're only going to touch the beginning tonight. So the beginning sets up the story. It grabs the reader's attention and establishes the situation for conflict. The book of Revelation is a very graphic novel. That's the way that I see it. So the middle complicates matters. It develops the conflict and it gives rise to the crisis. Every good story has a crisis. And certainly in the book of Revelation, there is going to be a crisis. And then the ending concludes the story. It resolves all conflicts and crises. Okay. And there is an ending to this story. And uh, most of you already know it. So the Revelation drama has all the elements of a novel. It has, it describes characters, feelings, thoughts, and conflict, as well as has elements of a movie, which is usually a visual way of describing action, uh, emotional aspects of a scene, abstract concepts, and inner conflict. So it has both elements of a novel and a movie. It's perfect for our time, isn't it? So... It also has a structure. It has a literary structure. It has a literary skeleton that organizes a story, which allows the story to move forward. And we're going to learn some of that structure tonight at the end of the study. Revelation also has a pace. Okay, that's the excitement and the action. That's followed by reactions and reflections. In this case, it's John's reactions, the angels' reactions, and also it's our, the readers' reactions uh, that follow the excitement, and the action. Revelation has turning points, okay? These are transitions that move us from the beginning to the middle to the end. So we have to keep in mind that there are turning points in the story. And uh, when you're reading the book of Revelation, see if you can identify what the turning points are. Now, there are two critical turning points, okay? The one that moves us from the beginning to the middle, and we're going to uh, see that tonight. And there's one that moves us from the middle to the end. And that's for one of our future studies, okay? Two critical turning points. Revelation has a crisis. Now, this is the second critical turning point, and this describes the final showdown. Yes, in Revelation, there's a final showdown. And the crisis, okay, the second critical turning point takes us to the final showdown. So the crisis in any story forces the central characters to take final actions to resolve the story. And Revelation is no different. <laughs> Can you say praise the Lord? Okay. We're going to begin with the throne room images. We're going to start in the throne room. And here you can see I've got a picture of it here in the, in the background of a PowerPoint slide that I found. And uh, you'll see there's the throne. There's J Jesus sitting on the throne. Uh, there's the seven spirits of God. Okay, we're going to learn what those are. The 24 elders and then the four creatures. The four mysterious creatures are, are uh, surrounding the throne. It's, it's very interesting. They're full of eyes. It's very interesting what this all means. So let's begin. So first off, there is the door to the temple, okay? If you recall that the types and shadows of the temple, uh, uh, Old Testament Israel, Solomon's temple, had a door. You had to go in through the straight gate, the narrow way, to go into that door. Then there's a trumpet voice that when that door is opened, it accompanies the opening of the temple door. In this case, the trumpet voice comes from Jesus himself. It is the voice of a trumpet. This theme is going to be repeated over and over. What is it about trumpets and a voice? That's the question. So when the temple door opens, the trumpet blows saying the temple door is open. So we see that there's one throne. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant is considered the footstool of God. 
Okay, and so he sits on a throne that's emerald green gold. Okay, that's what we see in the Revelation. It's shining in appearance. What comes out of that throne is bright light, which always represents revelation, thunder, which always represents God's voice. Okay, thunder and voices. So one throne. The platform that the throne is upon is a rainbow circle of colors. This, of course, is an allusion to Noah's flood promise. Okay, God sits on the circle. Okay, now he doesn't have a half of a rainbow. Okay, he's got a complete circle that he sits upon, not half. And that's uh, my belief of, of the way that it is. And uh, many people think that this is in the shape of a flying saucer with multiple rings. Okay, we have good imaginations, don't we? Now, there's one sitting on the throne. This is monotheism. There's only one God, and his name is Jesus. He first appears as a spirit. You can't look at him. It's light. And then he becomes a lamb slain on the middle of the throne. Okay, there's not two on the throne. There's only one. There's a shining jewel appearance. Okay, the one sitting on the throne initially has a shining jewel appearance of sardine and jasper stones. This is most likely what... Uh, Peter, James, and John saw on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now, the sardine and the jasper stones are the first and the twelve stones of Aaron's breastplate. Of course, he was the high priest. He had twelve stones in his breastplate. This breastplate only has two stones. Now, this signifies that uh, he's in charge of Reuben to Benjamin, the first and the last, the first and the last. And so what we, we're seeing here is that this is a Melchizedek priest that's sitting on this throne. This is this is Jesus, the Melchizedek priest. Can you say, uh, praise the Lord? Moving on. 24 thrones surround the one throne. This is the royal priesthood. Now, I want you to know that these are elders sitting on the throne. Listen, it's not God's will that we would stay eating pablum, okay? Uh, every Christian has to go through a bar mitzvah when they let go of mama's hands, that would be the church, and they get hold of papa's hands, that would be Jesus. That's the bar mitzvah. And when you become, it's God's will for all of us to become an elder. Some people pull the ripcord and jump out of the church before they can become an elder. Others stay in there and become an elder, and God begins to use them, and the head of every man is Jesus Christ at that point. But up until this point, we need our mama, the church to feed us, to help us grow, to tie our shoes, to uh, change our diapers, so to speak, to help us overcome some of the tests that every Christian goes through. But when we become an elder, uh, we begin to follow what the head tells us to do, Jesus Christ. Now, these 24 elders have crowns and white robes, which represent the blood of Jesus, washes our robes white. It looks like a Sanhedrin of the church. And of course, this is an allusion to the 24 courses of priests organized by David when they built, uh, before they built the temple. He organized the priesthood into 24 courses, each taking turns to serve. So let's look at some more of these images that are in here. Then there's the seven lamps of fire. We are told that this is the seven spirits of God. This is the menorah light. Now notice that when you went into the temple, you had a menorah and you had a table of showbread like there was in the tabernacle. There was no other light inside that tent. Without the menorah, you could not see the bread to eat it. And without the light, without the spirit, the Bible will never make sense. That's why we've got 44,000 Christian denominations. We've got 40 some thousand who have been eating the bread without the light, no spirit. There's only one proof that you have the Holy Ghost. It's found in Acts 10, 46. The spirit leads you into all truth. Without it, you will never get to the depths of the Bible and all truth. So this, the menorah light was needed to illuminate, as I said, the table of showbread. And you can find what the seven spirits of God mean here in Isaiah 11, verses 2 through 3. It's an anointing for wisdom, understanding, knowledge, counsel, power, moral reverence of the Lord, and quick perception of God's presence. You want to go back here and, and pray on these things and study them and ask God how to get more of each of them. Uh, these are the seven spirits of God. That's, it's not that God has seven plural spirits. These are the seven attributes of the one God, okay? This is his anointing that he can place on any one of us if we will seek him for it. Then there's the sea of glass before the throne. This is the pavement of heaven. It's crystal. It's translucent. Yet, it's also the roof of the created universe. It's tranquil. It's the roof because we see it over the uh, uh, four creatures. We also see that it looks like it's the pavement. So when men come up through the pavement in rapture, they stand on this sea. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a portal into the future, all those kinds of crazy things. Uh, I saw that there's uh, TV shows like Stargate that, that try to make this into some kind of a portal. Uh, the eyes of the creatures uh, and the wheels take care of that. So note that the sea of glass is seen again in Revelation 15 too. But in this case, it's mingled with fire and saints are standing upon it playing harps. The fire has purified the church and that's persecution pogroms by the beast. Okay, That's why we see them standing on the sea of glass playing harps. The fire is burning on the sea of glass. That's a persecution. Persecution always purifies the church, gets rid of the dross, brings in holiness and agape, love that the church needs. And uh, that's God's plan for the church is to purify it here in the end time. So the sea of glass is also seen as a sapphire payment in, in Exodus underneath God's feet as Moses and the 70 elders look on at the mountain and then they begin to hear the trumpet blaring. It's a sapphire pavement. Again, it's crystalline, it's translucent. And note three, the sea of glass is also seen as a roof over the four living creatures in Ezekiel 1.22. Okay, now the sea of glass, okay, uh, has several illusions in the Old Testament. That's why I'm bringing it up. That's the metaphor. Here you'll see the door into heaven where the voice of the trumpet says, come up here. Now, many people think that this means the rapture. That's foolish because this simply means that the door of the temple is open. He's going into the heavenly temple to see the prophetic future of the church. Uh, I like to think of it as the quantum leap, if you remember that old TV show, uh, where the door opens and uh, you enter into another dimension. And that's really what happens to John of Patmos. And then once he gets in there, he sees this. This is the scene. This is the way one person depicts it. He sees the circle of the, of the, uh, the rainbow around the throne. He sees one on the throne. He sees one throne. He sees these mysterious four creatures. We're going to talk about that. He sees the menorah. He sees the 24 elders. And he hears a lot of noise. There's sound all over the place. We need to talk about that throne room sound. So here we go. There's trumpet voices, thunder, and light flashes. Now, we, we first see this in Job 38, 4 through 7, when God challenges Job and he says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang. Now, that word sang is rana. Now, that word, uh, most of the translators and interpreters have said that that means sing. Uh, but if angels do sing, this word here is not exactly the word for singing. So they sang together and all the sons of God shouted, that's Ruah for joy. So Rana and Ruah, and they have meanings. In other words, the trumpet, Rana means shouting or creaking like a trumpet. It's the trumpet sound, okay? And then Ruah means volume, ear splitting volume. So this could be easily translated. The, more, the morning star shouted so loud that it would split your ears. They are the sons of God. So why the trumpet? Because it arrests attention. It gets our attention. It heralds events. It calls to worship and assembly. Okay, so that's the purpose of the trumpet. And we're going to see that in several places in Scripture. So there was a trumpet voice that called Israel up to Mount Sinai at an ear-splitting level. It was so so loud, the people began to tr tremble, and they asked uh, Moses if the if if he alone could go up there or some priests. They didn't want to go up there and hear this sound. Now this was accompanied by thunder, and of course thunder always is the voice of the Lord. Now, the trumpet also heralds new moons, feast days, the jubilee, and the opening of the temple doors. It also is a warning, and it calls Israel to war, to shout victory. Remember, Jericho, the trumpet was blown, and then they shouted with a voice of triumph. You can read about this in Ezekiel 33, 4, and Joshua 6, 20. Now, with regard to warning, it says in Ezekiel that if a watchman's been given something to warn somebody about, and he doesn't do it, the blood is upon his hands, okay? So that's, that is a, <laughs> a warning of a warning, okay? So the trumpet, the shouting, the run on the volume, they're together. It's also a call to praise God with shouting to dedicate the king or the temple. You can read about that in 1 Kings 1, 39. It announces the arrival of the Ark of the Covenant into the temple, 2 Samuel 6, 15. As I said, it's the watchman's call to warn of approaching judgment. We call this the blood call. This is found in Ezekiel 33, 3 through 6. I recommend you read that. The great trumpet also announces the day of the Lord. So there is one trumpet that is the greatest, the loudest, the most obvious. This is called the last trump in 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It announces the day of the Lord. 
you will find these scriptures fascinating, especially Zephaniah 1, 14 through 17. You got to read it after this Bible study tonight. So there's thunder and light flashes. Now, this is the voice of the Lord's mighty angels. And this is also called the voice of many waters. And so we see this thunder and the light flashes. Light, of course, is revelation. Thunder is the voice of God. But it's also the voice of the angels delivering God's word. Notice in Revelation 10, 1 through 4, we're not going to actually do too much talking about this because it's sort of in, in the, uh, the next couple of topics. Uh, next couple of sessions, that a mighty angel appears with a rainbow about his head. First of all, this is not Jesus Christ. This is a mighty angel. He roars, he shouts, then seven thunders utter words, and John is forbidden to write them. One thing I will tell you about this mighty angel is he has a small book in his hand, which is an allusion, allusion to Ezekiel chapter 2. In Ezekiel chapter 2, uh, that small book, that small scroll, is a judgment on someone. A judgment on someone. We're going to cover that here in a session here in the next couple, couple of, next couple of times. All right. So let's get back to that. Here's uh, one vision of what uh, the heavenly temple looks like. Kind of looks like a constellation, doesn't it? Or, or a galaxy, sorry. And uh, many people think it looks like, uh, you know, uh, a spaceship, an alien spaceship. But uh, it's interesting how this artist thought of it as the rings, colors of the rainbow kind of being progressively up like the old Dixie cups where the, the throne could be above everything else. And there you'll see the uh, seven lamps of fire, the menorah that way, the four creatures and the 24 elders sitting on thrones. All right, so we're done with the sounds of the uh, throne room. And now we're going to talk about these four mysterious creatures uh, that are found in Ezekiel 26, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. It's important to read all these to uh, kind of get an overall view of what these four creatures are all about. Okay, so the four creatures are woven into the veil of the tabernacle. And in this case, in Isaiah 6, calls them seraphim or burning ones. They are on fire. That's all the word seraphim means. They're cherubs, but they're on fire. Okay, it seems like they have the agape of God in them. Somehow they're intertwined with God. They're covered with ringed eyes, front and back also in their wheels. It would appear that their wheels and their feet transform one between the other. They become wheels when they move and they transform themselves into a chariot and then they become feet. It's a strange thing. It's kind of like the legs of a spaceship that land and then the wheels when it takes off, that kind of thing. There are six wings, as I, as I described this, uh, that two of these wings cover God's face. Now, where does that happen? Okay. And two cover God's feet. Okay, we can't see God behind these wings in the Old Testament, but we do see it in the New. It's Jesus Christ. With two, they cover his feet. Now, I just want to point this out, is that where is God's footstool? It's the Ark of the Covenant. It's on earth. How many of these cherubim were on the Ark of the Covenant? Two. Can you say praise the Lord? There were two of those wings are joined in flight. So each one has four faces. They face four directions. There's a human face that faces towards God. Then there's an eagle face behind them. It looks back with long distance eyes. There's an ox, which represents strength, and a lion, which represents courage, king of the jungle. Uh, this is a strange, strange image, okay? What is God trying to tell us about this? Many people have ideas about this. I personally just kind of accept it and don't necessarily see that these have uh, meaning other than uh, what they say, obviously, about those creatures. The human that represents logic, the ability to think, a consciousness. The eagle can see great distances. The ox is very strong, can pull its weight. Then the lion, of course, is a great hunter and is, uh, you know, the most ferocious beast of the jungle. Four faces. Now, these four creatures continuously declare God's name. They sign it with their hands. They cry. Okay. They sign it. They cry. And they define it, okay? They define it. And uh, the, uh, the point of this is, is that God's name is being declared while these creatures are worshiping him. They continue. So it's almost as if they are God's throne. <laughs> I've thought of these four cherubic creatures as the, you know, the four corners of God's throne. God's name uh, is continually before him. Now, anybody who doesn't think God's name is important, you're not looking at the book of Revelation. So they also seem to be the guardians of God's presence. They stand to the north giving admission. And of course, when the temple veil was rent in two, 
they now stand to the north. They divided the holy place from the holy of holies prior to Calvary. Once the, the veil was ripped in two, there's only one holy of holies place. Okay, it's, it's much bigger. Remember, the holy of holies was one third. The holy place was two thirds in terms of dimensions and cubits, 10 by 10 cubits. It's now the whole space is for worshiping God. So they move in flashing straight lines and Ezekiel zigzagging as the Spirit of God moves. They are, they are described as coals of fire and a burning lamp that goes up and down inside these cherubs. Light flashes out of the fire inside of them and the voice of God begins to manifest or you can hear it becomes audible. They form a four-wheeled arc or a chariot, if you will, when transporting the kavod, the fire of God. It's like their feet, all of their, their feet, uh, all of a sudden, or their wings maybe become wheels and uh, they begin to move. And uh, then the Bible says that their wings create a voice of speech of many waters. When you see the phrase of many waters, we're hearing the speech of more than one. It's the sound of the Almighty's voice. And these are wings moving. So God apparently speaks with their assistance. It's almost like they're a megaphone, if you will. Think of them that way or a loudspeaker. And there we'll see that with two wings, they covered his feet. There's the Ark of the Covenant, God's footstool. That's where his feet go. They're covering his feet. And then it says this, that uh, he has the four wheels, that becomes a chariot. And here's another vision or, or an artist's perception of what those wheels must look like. When God moves, they move in zigzag straight lines or you see the throne. And here's another artist's uh, idea of what they would look like with these faces. But he's only showing one face, the ox. You know, the lion, the, the human, and the eagle. So I thought that was interesting. Now, if you look at the veil, okay, in the veil, you'll see that there's two covering his feet. There's two, they're flying. They're crying, holy, 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 pronouncing God's name continuously, defining it and signing it with their wings or hands. Finally, tonight, we want to talk about the meaning of the scroll with the seven seals. This becomes prominent in Revelation chapter 5 and 6. And so we begin here. The scroll is, in fact, the revelation prophecy of the future, the things that shall be. This is where the future comes home to us, what God wants us to know, the Jesus name, Acts 2.38 church. This is the Jesus prophecy regarding his care for his church. Otherwise, he wouldn't have give us this prophecy. He cares about us. And this is only for those purified by his blood, by possessing his name in baptism, who are worthy to escape the full timeline of this prophecy. So seals one through four are intensely followed by the four creatures. They say, come and see. This is obviously the kickoff. This is the beginning sign. Okay, the beginning sign. Seals one through four match the colors and the attributes of Islam perfectly. White, red, black, and green, the sword and the horse. It says in Revelation 6, 8, that they lead the world to death and to hell. It says they, meaning all four horses of the apocalypse. And uh, of course, Muhammad rode the horse, al Barak. He had a scimitar, a curved sword. And of course they shout, Allah is great, Allah Akbar. And uh, they have different other attributes. So here's the seven seals. Seals one through four look like they're the kickoff. Here you can see seal one is open, the white horse. And uh, you could say, well, each of these horses represent different countries. That's possible. They might, this might be Saudi Arabia, this might be Turkey. Uh, this might be the uh, uh, ISIS. And the last one would be Iran the Shias of Iran and Iraq and Lebanon. A lot of people think that. So this is a drama. There's a beginning, a middle, and the end. So we've just seen the beginning with the first four seals, okay? That's the key. Here's the beginning. All right, this is the beginning of the prophecy. Now, I know you would like to know the middle and the end, but uh, that's going to have to come next time. So next time we'll talk about the middle and... Uh, Remember, there is always a transition that gets us from the beginning to the middle. We'll talk about that. And then, of course, to get to the conclusion, there is a crisis, another transition, and we'll talk about that. Well, I hope you enjoyed the study tonight. Uh, just remember, I reserve the right to change my mind, okay? As new information becomes available, because we know what it says in Daniel, that, it, that knowledge shall increase in Daniel 12 in the end time. If we're in the end time, and I believe we are, then knowledge is increasing. God bless you. We'll see you next time for another edition of 153greatfish.website.